Hey guys, just got back from Disney where I rode this great ride. It was pretty cool. They kind of send you back in time unnecessarily to chase after this giant creature. No, no, not dinosaur. Come on. It was awesome. There was this really crazy part where there was all this chaos and we were suddenly launched backwards into the darkness. What? No, not Everest, geez. Uh, th this roller coaster was cool. It had an amazing soundtrack, rock and roll music. Have you ever been on a roller coaster with rock and roll music? Wait, no, not rock and roller coaster. Guys, stop interrupting me. I'm trying to do an opening to this video, all right? I just rode Cosmic Rewind and we have got to talk about it. Now's a great time for you to head to the comment section and, and leave me a note telling me how wrong I am before you even watch the video because my opinion isn't right because it's not your opinion, right? Go ahead, I, I love engagement, so <laughs> leave me a comment and then maybe watch the rest of the video. Look, at no point in the production of this ride did anyone be like, hey, I've got a great idea for a Guardians ride at Epcot. This is gonna be amazing. Instead, what we got was like, a weird contractual loophole with Universal Studios where there was no Guardians imagery. So like now they can use these characters as willy nilly and as freely as they'd like in, in the Orlando parks. And, and so we got this one shot to do this really amazing thing. And this is what we got. This feels like it was made by a computer AI that just, we fed in every Orlando attraction and guest satisfaction surveys. And it's just like, well, I don't know, give them a ride roller coaster with music, backwards launches, God, and time travel. Slam, bam, thank you, bam. <laughs> but with Chris Pratt. Pew, pew, pew. Mamma mia. There's a thing that Kenny talks to me about all the time, about big budget movies, when we're talking about huge big budget Marvel blockbusters, like Multiverse of Madness, that are just tons and tons and tons of cash, and huge committees of people, and writers, and producers, and, 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 and executives, and studio notes. And all of that really muddies the water down into, into making a, a less engaging product, because so many cooks are in the kitchen, putting too many ideas into the stew. And this is the same thing. Like a lot of the rides at these parks, this too was designed by committee. It probably had a little too many cooks in the kitchen at one point, maybe with the best intentions, but ultimately they ended up using a lot of the same techniques found throughout Disney property. For example, there's already a time travel ride at Epcot directly next to this ride. Let me start by saying I enjoyed the ride. And one of my favorite parts of the ride was the queue. Uh, when you first get into the queue, man, that giant projection space volcano thing, when you first walk in, it's the world mind, I think. And it's the smartest supercomputer in the world. And it's got a huge fascination with that guy who's gonna play Mario. It, that, that's just like the primary character in this big world mind volcano screen. It's just, it's just Chris Pratt and, 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 and Disney World Easter eggs, like turkey legs. It's cool, the screen plays cool music, has fun visuals, but honestly, you zoom through this like little early room super fast, so like you're gonna miss a bunch of the fun stuff that happens on that screen, but it's okay, because you're gonna ride this a lot, and uh, when you rewrite it once every three to four years when you come, because that's the only time you can get a lightning lane, or you know, or you can maybe like waste your entire day waiting in the standby line when that finally opens up, you know, four or five hours to ride this coaster, sure, why not? The queue is full of these really cool light fixtures that I just have to call out. They're like these perfectly 3D printed spheres that look like they're perfectly safe to be hit with in the event they fall from the ceiling. It's like they just bounce right off of you. <laughs> I like to imagine Imagineering test bouncing all of the light fixtures they put in rides moving forward just in case things fall apart. The queue is also full of some really gorgeous models um, like there's this beautiful model of Xandar, which is very clearly where all the Epcot experience projectors from uh, Odyssey went, uh, because this is just all of that energy, just colorful lights on a gray surface that has te beautiful textures. I liked it, it was cool. Uh, the queue also has like fun spaceship models and like and like costumes. And, uh, and then there's this whole section with like this whole like news interview with some of the most egregious, cringiest, lunch break contractual cue card reading performances you, you'll ever witness. And Epcot too, because I love that place. It's awesome. I went there as a kid and I, I, I mean, I cannot wait to get to go back and ride Horizons. Also want to see the energy, dinosaurs, and of course, hear the veggie veggie fruit food. 
Rock is the best. They're like they're, they were like written by someone who like smelled a millennial once, and like I think I got it. After all of that, we're quickly hurried into a room that was very clearly uh, just a leftover set piece from the Hunger Games. There's just this weird angular purple room that we all just gather in with just blank walls, just just and just purple light. Like I was seriously expecting like Lenny Kravitz to come out and try to dress me in, in like, you know, like a leather dress. It's a really long, beautiful queue, unless you have a lightning lane, in which case you see nothing. You just get vomited into the second pre-show room and you miss all of the world building. <laughs> Not that there's much, but you miss all of it. Just a reminder, I liked the ride. It was fun, but this is my job, guys. My job is to overthink the soft goo that they feed you at theme parks. I gotta, I gotta put the heat to the goo, you know? That's my job. I gotta heat up the goo and see what's left after it condenses down. Right off the bat, I'm like asking myself where in the MCU continuity this whole ride lays because the first pre-show features Glenn Close, Nova, Nova Prime, Irani, Iranis, Iran, Iran, Ironda. But like, she's dead. Now I'm learning that none of these MCU characters are our characters. There is a different MCU timeline just for theme park events that does not involve or is complicated by anything that happened whatsoever in the 20, 30 plus films that have been slowly been released over the 10 plus years. All of these characters are none of the characters in these rides. So in this timeline, Groot doesn't die while saving the Guardians in the ship crash at the end of the first movie. Gamora isn't used as a pawn in collecting the Soul Stones. Xandar does not perish at the hands of Thanos as he goes to collect the Power Stone. And more importantly, Celestials exist in this bizarre toxic relationship where they do not communicate with each other, wherein one takes his younger brother baby egg and sends it back in time to kill the bugs who live on the back of his younger baby brother's eggs who are slowly feeding off of the intelligence of those bugs. Wait, you guys haven't seen the Eternals? No one has, including the Imagineers of this ride. <laughs> so immediately, I'm just left wondering why do I remotely care about any of these characters? If they're not the characters that I know, they're all devoid of any emotional sacrifice that they might have had to make at all during any of their journeys. I just have no investment in any of these things that they're selling them to me. These, these are like the mall Santas of Star Lords and Gamoras, all right? Just the hollow shells. I just think it's so lazy. It's not a problem with literally any of the other Marvel rides. Mission Breakout, it's super contained. You get there and then you break out. All right, so and now after, after the Hunger Games room, we enter this next room, which is pretty cool. Uh, one of the walls is clearly a screen. Can you guess which? Glenn Close joins us like an SAT prep instructor to give us this kind of like previously seen on plot point recap of everything we need to know. Like she just unnecessarily mentions the Big Bang, you know, and she's like speed of light, universe, energy. And then she's like, and the Zandarians have a special bowling ball we use to travel through space. And we call it the Glenn Close uh, looks over at the, <laughs> at the cue card. A uh, cosmic generator. Every time Glenn Close says cosmic generator, she has to read it. So that either says to me that the cosmic generator was a placeholder or it's just so absurd. Even American treasure Glenn Close can't get it under her belt. Also, I don't know what setting the render was put at when they were, you know, making this cosmic generator, but it has the same sort of 3D metallic reflective design that uh, was made famous in the 90s on a low budget computer animated reboot of the Transformers called Beast Wars. I mean, there's some there's some striking similarities to the cosmic generator and the, and the AllSpark. So we learn that Xandar wants to bring us to their planet and do a space jump, which is cool. I feel super honored by that. I cannot wait to get the Xandarian spirit jersey, okay? So we're handed off to Old Spice himself, Terry Crews, who brings us some of the cringiest pre-show material Ever. No one in my room laughed. Epcotians, citizens of Epcot. 
Oh, God. Does anyone know what they call themselves? And then after him yelling at us for a while, he's like, all right, go to this next room. And we all do. We all just listen to him because you just listen to the guy who's yelling at you for no reason, right? And then we get into the next room and there's this big, beautiful machine above us that's doing all kinds of swirlies and whirlies and lightning bolties. And Terry Crews continues to yell at us. Which is cool. Then the lights dim and suddenly we're in a Xandarian spaceship. The effect is pretty cool. It's my favorite part of Journey into Imagination. So now we're in a spaceship, I think. The room is weird, like really weird. Like much of the previous Q spaces, it, this room doesn't know what it wants to be, but that's okay. I know what I want it to be. See that animatronic rocket and Groot? That's what I wanted it to be. But instead, we it's just a pre-show room with big screens on big screens on big screens. And, uh, and there's the bowling balls there too, don't forget that. This ride does a really great job of separating itself from every one of the Star Wars rides out there. And this room is a really great example of it because every room that I walk through in the Rise of the Resistance ride felt like it had some sort of functional purpose outside of just providing exposition. I felt like I was on a Star Destroyer. I felt like I was being passed through all of these real Star Wars rooms with real practical applications. What is this space I'm supposed to be in right now? What is that giant window? Why do we have two uh, computer screens that are like FaceTime devices next to the cosmic generator? Like, well, what is this room? Anyway, Space God shows up suddenly and uh, he steals the cosmic bowling ball, opens up a wormhole to the past, and only the Guardians can save us. Why can only the Guardians save us, Kenny? Well, because they're there. They're just there. There's a teaser for this ride that in no way, shape or form connects to the actual plot of the ride that is way more compelling and has way more fun visual elements in it than most of the ride. Uh, and I guess that's when they get the distress call that stuff's happening, but they don't, they, they sh you know, I, I can't even go into the marketing for this ride because I mean, God. Space God is going to send himself back in time to stop Earth from existing, but he goes all the way back into the time to the Big Bang time, like a lunatic. Why do we go all the way back to the Big Bang? Humanity isn't that old, Space God. You should know that, right? None of this makes, this is where it's just like Disney. Honey, please do less, please. <laughs> I'm begging you, just do less. It just could have been like, hey, let's go to space. And I would have been like, oh, wow. I would love to go to space with you, Rocket Raccoon. Why did God have to come? <laughs> and also, why did Space God have to show up and completely take a steamy Space God dump on the entire continuity of the MCU world we're building? Remember when rides were just like, hey, let's just go back in time and steal a dinosaur. Or hey, come into this old spooky house and die. So let's talk about the Guardians, all right? Even from the painful cue moments of the pre-show, all the way to the later ride segments, the performances of the Guardians feel so disjointed. Ellen's energy adventure closed five years ago. So giving you everyone the benefit of the doubt, four years. You had four years to create this ride and shoot all the character stuff, but instead they did it in like 23 minutes in Chris Pratt's garage before a cast party. And the girl who played Mantis wasn't even there. <laughs> no one seems particularly committed. Even the Bradley Cooper voice double doesn't seem happy to be there. What? Look, they're our only chance of keeping track of that whack job until we get the cosmic generator back. If there is one standout star, it's Batista. It's Batista. Leave it to a wrestler to respect the Disney parks and their pre-show performances. He's a cake. What? Where's the cake? I could have just done Cosmic Rewind with Drax, and that would have just been a thousand times better. Drax just confusingly asking me what I'm doing in the park. Why are you carrying around a tiny creature full of popped corn. Why are you drinking from the skull of a tiny cartoon creature? Why are you, well, I guess everything we do at theme parks is a little ridiculous from the perspective of a non-ironic space creature with muscles. 
Got this. We're all toast. First it was cake, now there is toast. This plan is making me so hungry. Their performances though feel replaceable. Like the plot of this entire ride could be tweaked later a la Star Tours, where like different heroes or different things might filter in and out as the Guardian franchise is likely milked well past its age. What are you doing? Making the stinkiest of cheese out of that old wretched Guardian milk. We love the Guardians. They, they're so great. We loved them eight years ago. Okay, I've locked on to your vehicles. We'll be right behind you. Nothing to worry about. Unless we cannot stop this unusually large man. All right, let's talk about the ride, because honestly, one of the most impressive ride systems I've ever been on. Truly, it's unique. It's gonna offer up some insane new ride experiences in the future as we take this, you know, whole tech and start to play with it and do more things with it. It must be cool to like have your cart turn around and look in different directions. Yeah, it is cool, except when you're in the dark and your body can't see where it's going. So it can't process the, the movements that are going on inside your inner ear. And so you're flying 75 miles an hour this way while looking that way and then spinning around. And that is super disorienting. It is, it is a rough ride uh, for, for some people. It's gonna be really, really rough. It's hard. When I got out of the ride, I had to sit, take a seat. I had to sit down for a minute and catch my breath I was watching people come out and immediately have to sit. I don't. They're gonna have to put some vomitorium buckets, like like near the exit, because there are some there are some pale people coming out there stumbling. <laughs> that corner of the park is essentially just Vomit Land USA now, between Mission Space Orange and Cosmic Rewind. Come to Epcot, puke your guts out. Experimental prototype vomit of tomorrow. The set pieces in the ride are pretty impressive. There's the Starfield is gorgeous, gorgeous. It's no wonder Tokyo is tearing down their Space Mountain. In fact, I would put money on the fact that Space Mountain Tokyo is just gonna be a clone of this. You know how they build two of every ride? This ride system is just an amazing Space Mountain with Chris Pratt. The plot falls apart once you actually get on the ride. They capture Space God in that like netting thing that they used in the first Guardians. I don't know how strong the Nova Corps is gonna be able, and what happens when Space God breaks loose? And now I'm just back on Epcot, just wandering around, about to go get some roasted corn from like, you know, like the food and wine pavilion, knowing God is up there really angry and just being held back by some weak space netting. Uh, I got Iran. Iran, I run. Ironda. And it was fun. It was really fun. The, the song choices are great, but I, at a certain point, it almost becomes irrelevant. The song takes off right after the Big Bang explosion. And um, at a certain point, like, there's just so much chaos going on that, like, the, 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 the song just gets, like, pulled into the background and almost disappears. We are playing the music because you see, we're unnecessarily being used as pawns to distract Space God so that Star Lord can save rock and roll. The, I guess, none of this is ever explicitly described. Like, Space God shows up, he opens up a wormhole, Gamora instantly knows everything that's happening without any sort of information. The wormhole opens up and Gamora's like, but he's taking us back in time. It's like, who? how do you know, Gamora, what's going on? And then Rocket's like, hey guys, look at all these loose schematics I have for everything that is going on. Uh, I, I'm, a, I, I'm really good at SketchUp. It's just like, it's just like, everything's just so convenient. The plot, it's just, every, it's just, oh God. Please don't take this silly criticism and overthinking of this ride as some invitation for you to get upset that I thought the thing that's based off of your favorite thing was dumb. Because at the end of the day, it's a ride and, and it's fun. It's got an air conditioned queue. It's got a campy, cringy performance in, in a pre-show. A lot of creative energy went into this ride. Maybe too much creative energy. I, just, I was just left really just scratching my head at like, why? What does this add to Epcot? Nothing really. I'm not an Epcot purist. It was my least favorite park as a kid, but this just does not do anything for the park. It's sort of muddy and joyless. 
It's clear that at some point, at some place, there was some great visionary work put into this. Rumor mill abounds, like it's clear that they were trying to work in some kind of dinosaur time travel, all right? Like they were trying to reuse those dinosaurs as best they could. And uh, we ended up with a product that didn't reuse the dinosaurs, but still had all the plot devices put in place to keep the dinosaur animatronics in the ride. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Why are we time traveling? The ride was originally Exxon propaganda. And then it turned into Exxon propaganda with a Jeopardy segment with Ellen and Bill Nye before it. <laughs> All about how oil was the best. Yeah, dude, that's what this ride was. How oil was the best source of energy. And where that energy came from, the Big Bang, dinosaurs, they all died, turned to goo, now we drink it. What was the point of any of this? And not to mention there is no danger in this ride. The stakes feel so incredibly low and my involvement of the story feels like irrelevant from even being there. This isn't even the best Guardians ride. It's not the best Marvel ride. Like Mission Breakout is a complete package and it's an overlay. They built Epcot in three years. This took five. Anyway, I loved it. Nearly puked, three out of five stars.